going to start this meeting as we start all meetings uh, in the uh, Georgia State Senate, and that is uh, with a prayer and a pledge. So if you'll please bow your heads. Lord, thank you for this beautiful day in Savannah. We ask that you bless these conversations and fellowship we'll have during this meeting. And Lord, we just ask that the work we do, you will guide and you will put your abundant blessings and support behind. We do all these things in your most holy name. Amen. Amen. And if you'll please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. No Georgia flag, Senator? No, you know what? Uh, they, they may not know it, Senator. I appreciate it. But we do actually do a pledge to the Georgia flag in the, in the Georgia State Senate. Okay. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank each and every one of you for being here today. Uh, we're going to uh, go through a little bit of a process of uh, doing quick introductions for people. We have a couple committee members that unfortunately could not be with us today uh, through uh, travel uh, and unfortunately a loss of a family member. So we'll keep them in our prayers. Uh, Senator Beach's father passed away and he's at the funeral. So if you keep him uh, and his family in your prayers, I would greatly appreciate that. Senate Resolution 275 uh, was the culmination of a priority and initiative by Lieutenant Governor Burt Jones. Uh, the Lieutenant Governor met with me earlier this year uh, and talked about what his vision was and the work we needed to do and asked if I would work with him on that and I was glad to do so. Uh, so together we authored this resolution which passed through the Senate uh, and then committee members were selected by uh, the Lieutenant Governor's office to serve. Uh, and uh, this is the second of what will be six meetings for this committee. We are meeting all over the state. We are certainly excited to be here in Georgia's first city uh, as it is a huge economic powerhouse and engine uh, in all sorts of ways. Uh, and as we go around and do introductions to the committee today, I'm very excited to have Senator Derek Mallow with us today. Uh, last night, uh, we also had Senator Ben Watson, uh, both who serve you uh, extraordinarily well. Uh, Senator Watson and I actually came in together uh, about 13 years ago when he was in the House of Representatives, uh, and then he got a promotion up to the Senate. We're proud of him. Uh, does well in uh, former uh, background uh, or current background as being a doctor. And I want to take a minute to uh, really brag on Senator Mallow as well, who is newer to the Senate but has just came in, done incredible work, uh, has enormous respect, and does just a great job supporting this area of the state. So we're very thrilled uh, to have you here with us today, Senator. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, this time we're going to go around the table real quick and just do a very brief introduction so you know who the committee members are, and I'll ask uh, Senator Halpern to begin. Serve as our senior vice president for Metro Culture, Public Policy, and Challenge. <laughs> Greg Dozier, I'm commissioner of the Technical College System of Georgia. Champ Bailey, Pro Football Hall of Famer, College Football Hall of Famer, philanthropist, entrepreneur. Glad to be here. <laughs> and by by far the most popular person in this room. <laughs> I'm just here to thank you for all the memories. Uh, Trip Tollison, I work for the Savannah Economic Development Authority. I'm not on the committee, but we, we had to sit here because we're out of seats. <laughs> hey, I'm Burt Brantley with the Savannah Area Chamber of Commerce. Do you want me to? Yeah, Senator Mal, you want to say a few words? 
I want to welcome you all to the second senatorial district. And uh, John, you did exactly what I paid you for. That was an excellent <laughs> introduction. Uh, but I do want to take a little bit off because you forgot a couple things. So I'm going to take like 10 bucks off. OK, fair Thank enough. You. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We do have a couple microphones here. So uh, when we do speak, uh, we've got uh, this uh, meeting will be uh, recorded. Uh, and we'll make sure that it gets out to everyone. In a minute, I'm going to ask Lexi with our Senate press office to tell you about all the good things we're working on. We want this process to be uh, extremely transparent and inclusive to everybody who has ideas and thoughts to bring to the table. Uh, we have a packed agenda today, uh, so we've got those folks that already scheduled the talk. We are not going to have time for outside folks to talk who are not on the agenda today. Uh, if you do want to speak at a future meeting, if you would please send a note to myself and specifically Haley. Uh, who leads our uh, soon-to-be Senate research slash uh, legislative analysis and policy group. Uh, we are going to continue to, to look at that and do our best to get as much speakers as possible. However, we want any Georgian who has a good idea to go onto this website and submit testimony uh, written to us. Uh, we're going to get all of that disseminated to all the committee members, and as we go through the process of meeting, uh, and then pulling together a series of recommendations and a final report, we will take all of that into account. So please uh, take some time, uh, and if you didn't think of something today while you were talking, you can certainly follow that up through the website or through email, whatever your preferred method of communication happens to be. Uh, as we have speakers today, uh, the one thing I'm going to ask is we're going to try and stay on time. Uh, after we leave here, we've got another event we're going to be attending to. Uh, so in your speaking time, uh, if you would really focus more on workforce, uh, we know there's a lot of great things to celebrate, uh, a lot of the good things about your organizations, but we really want to focus today more on workforce. With that, I'm going to ask uh, Lexi if you wouldn't mind coming over and giving us a very quick overview of the technology we have in place and the other things we've got set forth. Please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, like Chairman Albers said, my name is Lexi Giuliani. I'm the interim director of the Georgia Senate Press Office. Um, and so I wanted to give you all just a quick update. I know that at our last meeting, we announced the launch of our microsite for the study committee. So if you guys uh, haven't had the chance to check it out, if you go to www.expandinggeorgiasworkforcestudy.com, um, that's a website that our office has put together in order to collect information about the committee, make sure that there's information out there to the public. Um, we'll be updating all of the meeting locations on the meeting schedule as we go through. Um, there's also a portal on this website where um, people can submit testimony directly to the committee. So this spreadsheet is something that we'll share uh, with the committee as we start collecting testimony from people. I think we've had one person submit written testimony so far. Um, so if you'd like a chance to do that, if you come to one of these meetings or don't have a chance to make it and would like to submit comments, this is an excellent resource for you to be able to do so. Um, we also have our video archives. So like I said, this meeting is being live live streamed to the Senate website, legis.ga.gov. We're on the Senate schedule. We've got a couple of people watching. But once this meeting is concluded, we'll have an archive of the video here. Um, so I just want to give you all a quick tour of how that works. There's a little drop down menu in the top left corner. All study committee recordings will live here. So if you ever want to go back and listen to comments that one of your colleagues offered, or if there was something particularly poignant that someone shared in a presentation, all of that will be available here. We're also working on making all of the presentations that um, people give during these meetings available. Um, and so that will be available in news and documents. We've had some issues with our hosting site, but I think we've worked them out. Um, so if anyone has any questions, let me know. My email is on the Senate website, and it's also down here on the bottom of the page on our microsite. And that concludes this morning's presentation. Thank you, Lexi. Great job. We appreciate everything you're doing. And Lexi is part of a working group that assists this committee, and that's representative uh, from, obviously, our press office, research, the lieutenant governor's office, our budget office, uh, legislative council, uh, and uh, others. So we've got a great team of people who are working on this. And the last person I want to take a moment to recognize is most everybody in this room will know uh, Miss Allie Farmer, who has uh, really been the project manager quarterback of this study committee. Uh, and we're here to uh, give a send off and thank you because Friday will be her last day with state government as she has taken a wonderful position in government affairs uh, with the Pace Academy. Is that right? Pace Center for Girls. So we're very excited for her. Uh, it's, it's a bittersweet because she's done a phenomenal job working together with me for the last several years. Uh, but we're excited about her new uh, position. So I say that, one, to thank Allie for extraordinary work. 
Uh, and number two, uh, if you email Allie after Friday or call her, you probably will get a, a kickback from that number or email. Uh, we are working through the hiring process, and we'll have some updated contact information out right away. In the meantime, please feel free to email me directly. If it's for presentations, Haley uh, is spearheading that for us, and then certainly anything press will be Lexi. All right, we're going to start getting into the meat of the presentation here, and I want to begin with somebody who's no stranger to any of us. We've known him in lots of different roles uh, and excited about his, uh, well, I guess it's not so new position anymore. We're going to ask uh, Bert if you'd come up and give us an update uh, and hello from the chamber. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for that warm introduction. Uh, I'm going to give most of my time back to the folks who are going to uh, present. The agenda is really strong, and you guys have uh, really a lot to go over today. But, you know, I want to just tell you, I, I moved down here uh, in February to take over as uh, President CEO of the Santa Area Chamber of Commerce. And the reason I did that is because we are entering an exciting time here in our community. You know, when you've been a city for 290 years, it's hard to say this is the most exciting time or because uh, a lot of stuff's happened. Uh, over almost three centuries, but uh, this is an incredibly uh, interesting and um, an engaging time right now for our community. Our, our ports, which you're going to hear, are growing like crazy. We've got a convention center that's doubling. You probably saw uh, in size. You probably saw across the river. You guys heard from our, our tourism industry this morning about their workforce challenges. Uh, and then we've got an incredible manufacturing sector that has been very strong here for a number of years, but is about to uh, even be stronger and, and play an even more important role in our in our economy. Uh, and then in, in the logistics sector as well continues to be incredibly strong. So uh, all that's very exciting, and there are a lot of folks here uh, that uh, are looking forward to that, but they're also concerned uh, about what's going to happen from a workforce standpoint, from a housing standpoint, from a child care standpoint, all the things that come uh, in transportation with this uh, incredible growth. So what I would love to tell you today is that we're working on it. Uh, we're all working together, uh, whether it's our uh, education partners at the school system, the Technical College, and our, our public and private institutions, uh, to our, our workforce development partners, uh, our economic development partners, we're all pulling together uh, and making sure that we're doing everything we can to help prepare our community for this incredible wave uh, of growth that's coming. Uh, and so we're very excited about it. We're very excited that you guys are here and you recognize the challenge that is not just here, not just in Atlanta, but really all over, uh, all over the state uh, we're with record low unemployment, which is, again, great. and and and. Uh, great part due to the, the policies that, uh, that you guys have put in place, uh, that creates uh, these needs. And so it, it really uh, demands that we take a really hard look at what our delivery systems are, what we can do better. Uh, and I would submit to you today, I think you're going to hear uh, from a couple of folks here in our community that, that we are doing some non-traditional workforce development here as well. Uh, and uh, I would just encourage this community, to, to this committee to really look at that and see how we can expand those and, and enhance them and also maybe duplicate the, those in some areas of the state that may not have uh, some of the same uh, you know, issues with military spouses, for example, or uh, with our, our folks that are coming out and re-entering uh, from our correctional facilities or our developmentally disabled uh, adults who, can, uh, who also can participate in our workforce. And so uh, we're, we got an all the above approach here. Uh, we're not, uh, it's not a rifle, it's a shotgun. Uh, we're really trying to address this from every different angle that we can. Uh, we're really thrilled uh, that you guys are here, thrilled to have this opportunity uh, to really shepherd our community into a, our community into a new era of growth and pro prosperity. Uh, and we need your help. We need your help. You guys have been very helpful to Savannah. Uh, we'll probably be asking for more things uh, as, as we come, but it's all towards making sure our community and our citizens have every opportunity to raise uh, their quality of life uh, and, and be more involved in our community, be more engaged in their, in their child's education, and then uh, a, a better part of, of making us a really special uh, place to live and, uh, and work and, and grow. So, again, thanks for being here. I uh, will cede my time back to the rest of the agenda. Uh, really appreciate y'all's focus on this. If there's anything that we can do uh, at the Savannah Chamber or any of our uh, affiliated groups and, and partners, please uh, let us know. Uh, thanks for being here, and I uh, look forward to today's discussion. Thank you so much, Bert, uh, for not just leading the chamber, but the incredible work you did for over two decades for the state of Georgia and, and all those many positions. We really appreciate it. Okay, next, I w first want to thank uh, Savannah Economic Development Authority, CETA, for hosting us in this beautiful room and building today. Uh, and I think we're going to hear from Trip first, and then uh, also we're going to have uh, from the Joint Development Authority here in Savannah Maria. So if you all would make your way up to the front, we would love to hear from you next. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for being here, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for selecting Savannah. I think this is y'all's second meeting. Um, glad that we're able to host. Uh, so today, this is, as we all know, this, this issue is so critical to the state and, of course, our region. 
Um, on April the 25th, 2022, um, Benji and Anna are here. I saw Anna somewhere, okay, back there. Anna uh, is with the Bryan County Development Authority and Benji is with the uh, Bullitt County Development Authority. And then with Brant uh, in Effingham County, on April the 25th, we found out we won the Hyundai project and we celebrated and went to bed late. So that's a fun story to tell. The next day we got out and went, holy beep, um, where are we gonna get all these workers? And so that's been a constant conversation and a lot of activity that's been going on uh, since, since the uh, project was awarded. And then of course on May 20th, uh, 20, 20, 2022, the governor and company executives made the announcement, but we have been you know, working very hard on trying to address the workforce issues here locally. Uh, we did an assessment, and then of course Goldstream's here, and they're gonna talk today as well. But we did an assessment based on what we think we need to hire just in the manufacturing sector over the next eight years, and it's pretty alarming. Uh, 18,000 jobs that we're gonna have to fill, um, and that includes obviously Hyundai, their suppliers, uh, the, the other manufacturing uh, corporations in the community. And so it's, it's, it's a big lift, and we decided the best thing to do was bring on somebody within the JDA that has a lot of workforce experience, HR experience in the manufacturing sector. So that person is Maria, who's gonna talk in just a moment. But we have been asking for so much stuff out of Atlanta um, that every time I would show up at the governor's office, the governor would roll his eyes at me and, you know, what do you want now? Uh, and then, of course, you know, all of our local folks, were, we've been really put in a pickle as we've had a lot of great economic success in the region. But I think you'll be impressed with what Maria's doing and what we're trying to do locally as it relates to workforce, and maybe this could add to something uh, as a whole with the state. I will tell you that what Maria's doing is, is fantastic. We're in the middle of a study that she's gonna talk about, a workforce study that several corporations in the JDA got together to fund. And um, again, taking kind of matters in our own hands and, and the study will be ready in the middle of August or late August. But what I'm excited most about is that this study takes it even further. And what we're doing is with DCI, which is, which is a public affairs kind of firm that does a lot of research, uh, communications firm, and we're gonna go out and target probably 10 to 15 different markets in the United States to recruit workers. And that's gonna be a big, a big plus for us, and that's what I'm looking forward to, because we know we can't fill all these jobs within 60 miles uh, of Interstate 16 and 95, but I'm stealing some of Maria's thunder, so I apologize. Uh, but I think you'll uh, enjoy what, what she's doing and what we're trying to accomplish. So, um, any questions before I introduce Maria? Any questions to committee members? Again, thank you all for being here today. Um, sorry I couldn't make supper last night, but hopefully we'll have a good afternoon and, and when we tour the site. So Maria, please come forward. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Tripp. Good morning, everyone. All right, hang on just a second. All right, as Tripp mentioned, I am a uh, I'm Maria Whitfield. I have been working in human resources for the past 27 years, but I have been working in this local area for the past 20 years in manufacturing as an HR director. I have worked at companies in chemical manufacturing, uh, basically to help startup companies. One of the companies I worked for in Liberty County was SNF Holding Company, which when I started had 200 employees, and when I left had 5,000 employees. So I have a little bit of experience building workforces. The second position after 10 years, I was hired to become the director of HR for DRT America. I was the very first employee hired, and it was very interesting because I was able to build a company from the ground up to include going to France multiple times uh, to help to just learn the culture. Again, another chemical manufacturing company. A few years later, we purchased Pinova Incorporated, which is down in Brunswick, and we were acquired by a larger company called Firmanish, which actually has uh, 20,000 employees globally. So I, I did have a lot of access to tools within uh, the uh, chemical manufacturing field. 
Uh, right before I, I, my son actually was playing basketball and I decided I wanted to move closer to the Savannah area. So I looked for a position that was closer and was able to start working for Norma Precision, which is an ammunition manufacturer located here in Chatham County, but was gonna, going to actually build a plant right across from the Hyundai site. So I knew firsthand what it felt like to feel the impact of Hyundai. So I'd like to tell you today just a little bit about what I've been working on. As Tripp mentioned, we are working on a workforce study. Uh, so this is really the first order of business in my new role. And, and I would say I'm quarterbacking the study. This workforce study is local to the area. So Bryan, Effingham, Chatham, and Bullock counties. It's being conducted by Wadley Donovan Gutshaw Consulting, which we call WDGC. And many folks in the room have actually talked to them because they were a part of the workforce study. Uh, they are actually going to help us, and we hired them to complete a strategic, comprehensive workforce plan. So the study, of course, is designed to identify labor and supply challenges facing existing employers within the region and, of course, future employers in the region. All right. So the first thing that we did was actually uh, do a market analysis. This was step one, or task one, of the workforce study. And this is to identify geographic parameters within the four county region, which is really basically within a one hour commute of the Hyundai site. And those 16 primary counties are listed, as you can see, a couple of them are in South Carolina. The second step of, or the second part of, of step one was, of course, to define the market analysis. So we defined the market as market's critical labor demands and supply shortfalls. We've identified stakeholders that have resources to efficiently address the needs and challenges, and specifically, the positive and negative market indicators of population statistics, workforce profiles, education, industry and occupational profiles, market wages, and of course, high school graduate pipeline. The second step of the workforce study was to define the immediate needs and challenges. And so this was uh, actually kind of my first project. We created 93 questions in electronic form and actually had 26 companies volunteer to be a part of the focus group. Of those 26 companies, we had 22 companies that actually completed the workforce study and also completed one-on-one -on -one interviews with WDGC. We also decided that it wasn't fair for just those companies to be a part of the workforce study, so we sent out the workforce study to 140 companies within the region to include a few uh, companies that were outside of the JDA, where we had 18 companies volunteer to take on the electronic survey. So in total, we had 40 companies complete the electronic survey. Some of the questions were related to, of course, workforce statistics, location, nature of business, pre-employment requirements, recruitment sources, training, of course, time off, engagement, and competitive demand outlook. The second part of task two was, of course, completing uh, the round table sector interviews, and really this took the longest. We actually had one-on-one -on -one interviews with some of our partners that are within the region, which would be staffing agencies, workforce development partners, high schools, higher education, transportation sector, uh, economic development professionals outside the JDA because we know the Hyundai effect is gonna go beyond the local area. We also had political roundtables by county and spoke to military groups to include spouse groups um, within the USO, or spouse groups, the USO, and also a group called Hiring Our Heroes. Where are we at today? This is the current phase of the study, and as Tripp mentioned, our workforce study should be completed sometime before the end of August. So task three is actually creating the workforce plan. So the scope, of course, is to combine tasks one and two, plus research into three other mega industrial projects outside the area that are similar in size to share best practices. And of course, when the study is complete, we will have a full definition of skill sets, demand, talent deficiencies, and of course, we'll also do a deep dive into the workforce development plan and share best practices. At this point, we will have the framework to execute the plan and we'll share with all of our stakeholders locally for buy-in. Again, as Tripp mentioned, this should be toward the end of August. 
All right, task four is Trip mentioned. Uh, we also have a marketing company that is a partner of WDGCs, and they're actually what we would consider an external group. Uh, and they have worked with many companies around the world, tourism, economic development companies, Baton Rouge, Birmingham, Chattanooga, Cincinnati, and Colorado Springs, to name a few. They're gonna help us identify best bet markets and marketing communication to help the JDA attract workers to this particular region. DCI, of course, will use tasks one and two to identify the best bet markets to recruit from, and they will also use analytics and an attraction index to attract and identify locations. So in the end, the JDA will receive six to eight actionable marketing items and recommendation based on DCA's experience and, of course, data around their talent research. All right. Next, so that's related to the workforce study. Um, one of the things that I work on is, of course, working with existing industries. And I'd like to share just a little bit about that. So I am working with many companies around the region, existing industry primarily, to talk to them about how they can create recruiting efforts, very creative recruiting efforts, uh, employee engagement, and lots of, lots of retention tools. All right, workforce needs. This is the numbers that everybody has kind of been waiting for. So Hyundai, will have 8,100 jobs, and, and everybody knows and has seen that number. Hyundai also anticipates hiring 500 employees before the end of this year. The majority of those employees will be people from the US. I think it's important for everyone to know there seems to be a stigma within the, the community that they're only going to bring folks from their corporate office, and that's just not true. Right now, uh, they have hired their technical talent and their startup teams, and many of them are Korean that are here in the area. However, they will be hiring the majority of the people from the US. In addition to that, to date, we have 5,000 new jobs announced from tier one suppliers. And uh, I'd like to point out that not all suppliers are from this area. Some are, some are going to other areas. Uh, in addition to that, we know that there's a need for existing industries. For example, Gulfstream just recently announced an expansion and there's others that have announced expansions. So we know that, of course, the workforce is a ma major initiative and would like to share those numbers. So next, we have a snapshot of hiring needs. And again, this is estimates and projections, and I want to make sure that you guys are clear on that, specifically because it may ebb and flow depending on demand, right? So right now, uh, between 2023 and 2020, 2031, uh, we will hire 17,750 people. That's the estimate and the projection. Now, while there's an immediate need for employees around the region, I'd like to point out that in a, in a lot of cases, it's a nine-year ramp up. So those 17,000 people aren't needed tomorrow. Uh, we are going to basically divide them between now and 2031, and some companies will hire more, some companies will hire less. For example, one company's ramp up within the JDA is 87 employees this year, 260 in 2024, 130 in 2025, 130 in 2026. However, it also depends on the plant and, and the plant being built and making sure that they have all of the needs that they need to be able to hire the employees. All right, next, I'd like to share a little bit about what existing industries are telling me. So, of course, as I mentioned, I'm currently working with many existing industries around the region. I've had about 50 workforce meetings with various companies around the region, uh, and this is what I'm hearing. Uh, so what are you doing to keep your employees? They're offering more money and promotional opportunities. They're getting faster in response time to job applications. This is critical because they literally are all competing for talent. They're offering flexible working arrangements, where I've never seen before, especially in manufacturing. Uh, they're offering professional development, quarterly bonuses, attendance bonuses, health and wellness programs, and I've even heard of a company that's offering flexible day where you choose the day that you would like to get paid just to try to attract talent. Recently, I heard of a company building an on-site child care facility and another company that's offering free child care to all of their employees. Of course, free lunches. Uh, some companies are building cafes and cafeterias within their facility to help to just engage and retain talent. In addition to that, many are changing their wait times for benefits or compensation for not taking the benefits. For example, military folks, especially around the region. More recognition programs, of course, larger referral bonuses, uh, wellness and mental health benefits, and of course, fun at work. I'm seeing lots of that, lots of competitions, lots of things that are going on within the community. So I thought that was very interesting to share. 
Next, one of my other missions is, of course, youth workforce development. And one of my personal missions, because I've worked in manufacturing so long, is to help break the myth that trades and manufacturing jobs are dirty or dead-end jobs. I know how much they pay. I know um, some of those jack trucks in the parking lot, and it's amazing to see some of uh, you know 18 and 19-year-olds that are making $70,000, $80,000 a year. So that's one of my missions. I've been working with all the CTAE professionals around the region to help them figure out how they can tap into this market and identify those students that should go straight to work. Uh, in addition to that, we've had job fairs, information sessions, career discussions, and next week we're actually taking all the CTAE professionals from around the region to the Kia plant so that they can get a snapshot of what that looks like uh, and what future jobs will look like. All right, and of course, um, the last part of my position is building connections. So of course, I am trying to make sure that I'm a resource for industry and of course, connecting them in any way with resources around the region to include um, local technical colleges, military installations, various associations, staffing agencies, executive recruiters. There's even an AI company that recently came to me and talked about their new efforts in recruiting, which I think is very interesting. All right, that's it. Does anybody have any questions? Maria, thank you for that great presentation. Are there questions from our committee members? That was such a comprehensive presentation. Uh, I think you proactively answered a lot of questions. Uh, I know we've already uh, had some preliminary conversations, but I think it would be really important for us to continue to follow up with you for the important lessons you have uh, already learned along the way, but also what you uh, continue to see evolving throughout this process. So we as a state can make sure that we're doing are part of that job. But thank you to CETA and the great work that you're doing with the Joint Development Authority. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up, uh, we will have uh, Mark and Jay from Gulfstream, one of our crown jewels here in the state of Georgia. Uh, come on down, Jay. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for um, thank you for having us. Uh, workforce development is top of mind at Gulfstream these days, to say the very least. And I want to walk you through uh, some things that we've done here recently, and some of the challenges that we're facing. High class problem, but challenges we're facing with the uh, the current workforce needs that we have. So the the topics I want to cover uh, break down roughly into uh, early career programs that, uh, that we've supported, uh, technical schools, and some apprenticeship programs. A key theme through all of this really is we have to start with the kids early. If you're waiting till junior year, goodness sake, senior year, way too long. We need to be hitting these kids in junior high so that when they go into ninth grade, they have a plan. Plans can change, right? But they need to go into ninth grade, starting ninth grade, with an idea and a plan. And, and that get that done, that's gotta be a focus with teachers, with parents, uh, educating them on opportunities, what's out there at the junior high level, and, and, and especially emphasizing uh, or undoing the greatest disservice we've done to the last several generations, and that is telling the kids and the parents that if you don't go straight to high school, I'm sorry, to college out of high school, then you're a failure. That's just not, not true. Um, I could share lots of examples that uh, we don't have time for on that front, but uh, rest assured there are some excellent careers. Uh, there are people turning wrenches on airplanes at Gulfstream today making more money than I graduated, than, than colleagues that I graduated from Georgia Law School with are today. So take that home with you. Uh, Groves High School program, we, uh, I'm particularly proud of this program. Uh, Mark Bennett and uh, Kyle Redner, uh, who are with me here, uh, have done tremendous work with that program. In, in short, the way it works is we partnered, we've partnered with the Chatham County, Savannah Chatham County School Systems and Savannah Tech to create, uh, a, again, an aviation pathway program that, that takes advantage of the dual enrollment uh, opportunities that we have in Georgia. I wanna emphasize that although it is an aviation pathway program, the skills that the kids are learning through this program are equally applicable to any advanced manufacturing uh, job. So they can go out of that program, walk straight to Hyundai, and be very well equipped to, to, um, to, to do work there. Uh, the way their program works is we recruit out of eighth grade. Uh, kids enter Groves, they come from all over Chatham County. 
Uh, this program is set up to accommodate up to 75 students per grade. And uh, we just graduated our first uh, cohort or, or a class, if you will, and, um, and, and hired them into Gulfstream. So the way it works in short is, um, again, we partnered with Savannah Chatham County School System, Savannah Tech. Uh, we invested, we Gulfstream invested uh, a little over a million dollars, half a million dollars of that was to buy equipment for the lab so that the kids are training on the same equipment that they would, train, they would work with at Gulfstream and the other half being to support the program. Uh, kids choose a sub-pathway depending on what their particular interests are. First two years, they're in Groves High School classrooms, Groves High School labs, uh, taught by Groves High School teachers. Last two years, junior and senior year, same classroom, same labs, but now they're being taught by Savannah Tech professors and of course getting dual, uh, dual enrollment credit. Uh, so that's, a, I think, a great example of a business leaning proactively into uh, the workforce challenge and, and getting some real results out of it. Student leadership program, uh, this has been around since 2008, uh, formed by Gulfstream and is a men mentorship program, again in partnership with the Savannah Chatham County School System. When originally envisioned, uh, the, the primary focus of the program was to uh, uh, get kids to stay in school. We had a bad retention problem. The uh, Savannah Chatham County School System has tackled that and the focus has now shift, shifted uh, more, more tightly on educating kids on what their career opportunities are and then getting them to mentoring them to plan for how they're going to jump into that career opportunity immediately after graduation. We've, <clears throat> we've uh, invested about $10 million in this program uh, since the beginning. Youth apprenticeships, we actually have two types of youth apprenticeships uh, that I'll talk about. This one uh, internally referred to as just the high school apprenticeship program. Uh, we hire uh, junior and senior high school students to come in as apprentices in all parts of the company, from technical jobs to accounting to, to uh, uh, customer support, you name it. And we have about 100, employ excuse me, 100 students that are in this program, they get paid. Uh, while they're working during the school year, of course, they're working in the afternoons. In the summers, they work full time, and they get exposure to, to uh, you know, working in a real business and, and you know, exposure to things that they hopefully will uh, like and and uh, choose that for their career. Uh, Savannah Tech can't say enough about can't say enough about how great uh, this relationship has been. It goes back to 1967 when it was going by a different name when we first opened up here in, in Georgia. The first 100 employees were, were of Gulfstream uh, were trained by Savannah Tech's predecessor. And, uh, and, and the sort of two primary categories of, uh, of work that we do with Savannah Tech are first, uh, in no particular order, but first the fantastic A&P school that Savannah Tech has, Airframe and Power Plant. That's the name for the FAA, FAA license to be able to work on or be a mechanic on airplanes. Uh, we've, uh, we've partnered with them since, uh, since day one and again, can't say enough about how, how a quality, how, what a quality operation that is. The other category are filling out uh, skill sets on the, primarily the manufacturing side and I won't read to you what's on the slide, but I'll give you one quick example. So building the cabinetry in a Gulfstream airplane or a high-end yacht um, that's, that's a craftsman's job. You don't hire somebody off the street and have them doing that work in a couple of weeks. That's a real craftsman job. A number of years ago, we were, we were having challenges finding people to come in, come into the, that part of our business. And that's a really important part of the business because customers kind of like things to be perfect in our airplanes and we want them to be happy that they're perfect. So the way we partnered in, in that example with Savannah Tech, although we've done the same thing many times, is we picked one of our master craftsmen in the, in the uh, cabinetry shop and then put him over at Savannah Tech as they, while still on our payroll to teach the classes and then to teach the teachers. And, and that worked out, we've done the same thing with upholstery and a number of others. Uh, that worked out very, very well. The students loved it. They're talking to somebody who actually does it. And we loved it because the class is a, however long the class is interview and um, you get to see work ethic and the like. And of course the, Professors at Savannah Tech love it because they're building their own skill set. So just an example. With Savannah Tech, <coughs> again, we're put, we put our money where our mouth is. We've invested over $5 million uh, with them, and, and that's trust me, that has been a fantastic investment. Return on invested capital there is fantastic. 
So I mentioned we have two flavors of, of um, apprenticeships. Uh, the second one is more of a direct apprenticeship to a specific job program than the first one. The first one is exposure to Gulfstream, uh, not necessarily or not as focused on the kids graduating out of quote, graduating out of that apprenticeship program to come to a specific job at Gulfstream. This program is very different. Uh, we bring kids in to the, currently with the three categories you see here, completions, painting, so painting a Gulfstream airplane is harder than you might think, uh, upholstery, and uh, equipment technicians. Uh, quickly, equipment te technicians, a lot of, um, uh, a, lot, a lot of, for lack of a better term, robots and the like in the, in the manufacturing process, and we need people to know how to work on those, so that's what that means. So with all three of these programs, we bring, we, we identify kids, we bring them on the payroll, and, <clears throat> and they're on our payroll while they're learning the job. And, and um, most of that, they're in class at Savannah Tech, taking classes, full-time classes. We're paying for the classes if, if there's a charge for it, if it's not part of the grant program. And then, uh, then they come out with that basic skill set and then go through, uh, go, go into that job category. And as they earn uh, certificates and additional skill sets, their pay goes up accordingly. So they have a you know, clear milestone path to say, I'm starting at this pay rate, but if I do X and then Y and then Z, my pay goes up and up and up, and I've got a career in the Gulfstream beyond that. So that's some of what we've been doing, and, and uh, what do we ask you to do as the committee or suggest that um, uh, where we can put some resources? Uh, a lot of it is keep doing more of what we have been doing. Uh, the HOPE program, the HOPE grant program is fantastic. Uh, our experience with the technical colleges has been fantastic, uh, but we just need more of it as the old saying goes. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our excellent relationships with Middle Georgia State University, uh, which has a world-class, and I'm not exaggerating, world-class aviation program from pilots to mechanics uh, to uh, even uh, air traffic controllers, and, and then the uh, uh, the engineering schools across the state. That's a little bit beyond this conversation, so I'll just leave it to say we have, um, we think the state's doing a great job there. Uh, last slide, last but not least, uh, where we've been recently and, and the challenges we're facing. Uh, over 20,000 employees uh, system-wide at Gulfstream, over 13,000 of those in Georgia, 1.2 billion in payroll in Georgia. Uh, we've added uh, well over, since in the last 18 months, we've added, uh, I'm sorry, these numbers below the the hiring numbers, these are system-wide, about 60% of those will be Georgia, just to, to, to uh, apply the secret Dakota ring, uh, the, the Rosetta Stone. Um, round numbers are the last 18 months, uh, close to 3,000 hired. Uh, it, net new numbers in Georgia, the next 18 months, uh, over uh, 2,200 net new jobs as a target in the next 18 months. So uh, a lot of work to do, appreciate your help. Thank you for your time. Entertain any questions, Senator, if we have time. Yeah, thank you, Jay, and I uh, appreciate all the work that you and, and Mark and the rest of the Gulfstream team not just does for creating jobs, but the tremendous impact to the community here for, for so many decades. And I want to take a moment, too, to personally thank you for your additional service you do for the state of Georgia as the chairman of the Georgia Development uh, Department of Economic Development, which obviously is, is the main point of contact for us to woo in all these great jobs statewide. So thank you for your service there. Are there questions from the committee members? Questions from Senator Estevez. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for, for highlighting the development programs you have going on. How have you been able to, two questions, quick questions. Mm -hmm. Have you been able to tie uh, how effective these programs have been to, to providing Gulfstream with uh, employees uh, long term, and then the second is how do you uh, market these particular apprenticeship programs to the students? So the uh, <clears throat> on the, uh, the the second category of apprenticeship program that we talked about that's the direct <coughs> direct apprenticeship into a direct specific job that's brand new or relatively new, just a few years old. Uh, the the uh, uh, capture rate has been fantastic. I don't know the exact percentage, uh, and I'll call in a lifeline to Mark or Kyle to answer the first, the, the, the other question because they're these are these are the guys who have the boots on the ground. Yeah. Uh, on the recruitment, we partner. 
Senator, on the recruitment, we partner with the Savannah Chatham County Public School System, Effingham and um, Bryan County, as well as our friends at TCSG, uh, Savannah Tech. We typically recruit jointly uh, at the high schools. That way they'll see the Gulfstream job, but realize how they can work with TCSG and Savannah Tech to access uh, the Hope Career Grants. So we work really well together. Question from Senator Halpern. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I also am really focused on this apprenticeships that you're doing, because uh, I think it's, it, it's just wonderful. My question is this. We know that there has been a real push towards getting kids to four-year colleges. Um, I think apprentices, apprenticeships and what you're doing here is a great way to introduce people to different career tracks and then employ them. You've spent a lot of money on this. I am wondering this question. Would you ha how many more students do you think you would have to participate in these programs if you had more, you know, if you had unlimited funds to actually invest in these, would you find more kids who are willing to do them? I guess my question is really asking, are you seeing a difference from year to year to year to year in the growth of interest from students themselves in moving down this track versus what we have generally pushed as a more traditional track? <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 one comment that I'm going to call on Mark again to, to answer the bulk of the question, but the, uh, the one comment I would make is we've had students come in through the high school apprenticeship program working in technical jobs that, that are you know, technical jobs that don't need a college degree who've gone on and said, you know what, this is great, but I want to be an engineer. And then we've had others that said, you know what, this is great. I don't want to go to college right now. I want to go do this. But then down the road, they do go to college. So a quick example, and I won't give the whole story, the, the, uh, so Gulfstream has more business aviation maintenance technicians working for it than any, any other company on earth. The guy that runs all of our service centers, he has more business aviation maintenance technicians working for him than anybody on earth, except his bosses, of course. He's the product of a dual enrollment program, came out, got his A&P, <clears throat> went and worked, turning wrenches on airplanes for a number of years, then went back to college and now is in that position. So that's a story to tell too. Mark, I'll defer to you for the rest. Yeah, we are seeing some big improvements in awareness. So Kyle just shared with me that of the 100 high school youth apprentice we hired, we had over 400 students apply for those jobs. Uh, so we are seeing movement there. I think the biggest opportunity we have is with uh, our friends at TCSG. You know, uh, I want the kid in Southwest Georgia or Northwest Georgia to hear about aerospace opportunities in Savannah and Brunswick or in Atlanta. I want the kid in Southeast Georgia to hear about the incredible film and TV uh, certificate they have in Atlanta. So I think the opportunity is how do we support our friends at TCSG to make certain every kid, especially in rural Georgia that might not be aware of these opportunities, how do we make certain they have access and awareness to these programs at TCSG? And hitting, hitting, hitting that awareness at no later than the junior high level, so they've got time to do something about it. Other questions, uh, Champ? I do. Um, great job, by the way. Uh, kind of want to pick up on where the senator started with the marketing aspect of it. Mm -hmm. How are you targeting these kids? Because you mentioned eighth grade. Like, I mean, that's that's. That's young, but I, I, I do believe you have to start young. Like, how are you targeting these kids? And f for my own sake, how, like, what's fueling this growth? It's a two-part question, so. Wait, what's fueling the growth that the- uh, In your company. In yes. the company? Yes. So yes. I'll answer that question and then turn to the expert Mark to answer the first part. Okay. So we, uh, our business is booming. Uh, we've got, uh, I think the, the um, short version is we, We've got the best workforce in the country, in the world, I should say, doing this. We've got uh, the best products uh, because of the investment we've made, our parent company has made in R&D. Our products are at least half generation technology-wise ahead of everybody else, and we have the best customer support organization in the world. It's, it's, even our competitors don't argue with that. So our, our airplanes come out high quality. All mechanical things break, but when they break, we're Johnny on the spot to take care of the airplane, get it right back in the air. That drives sales. We're taking market share from our, uh, we're taking market share from our competitors every day. 
and um, and the business is booming. Twenty uh, the last couple of years have been some of the strongest years in the in the company, and our literally our high class problem is we can't get the production rate up fast enough to match uh, the demand we're seeing. Uh, so that's the the, sh the short answer. You build a good product with the good people, the right people, and uh, they will come. Mark, to you for the rest. Yeah, thank you. Um, our, our goal is to have every eighth grader come through the facility. Uh, we, we haven't hit 100% of that. There's just a lot of eighth graders. Um, but anytime you come out to the plant, you'll see a group of students touring the plant, seeing it, touching it, uh, smelling what a facility looks like. That's, that's the best way to create a, uh, awareness. Um, for those students outside of the area that may not get to come and kick the tires on an airplane, uh, we have created a website, and it's in various stages right now, where a teacher in rural Georgia can download some aerospace curriculum. We can even send them some, uh, a little bit of swag to inspire those kids to consider aerospace. So to, to Bert's comment, it's really, uh, you know, uh, a, a shotgun approach. We, we encourage our employees to go talk to their kids' classroom, even earlier than eighth grade. Uh, so, you know, it's a process that we can talk about. They, they call Kyle, a parent calls Kyle. We have swag. We send um, swag with the parent to the classroom to create that um, awareness. One of the cool things we should have brought, but we created baseball cards for the various jobs at Gulfstream. So it hits some of the other questions around, you know, what does an engineer pay? How much do you have to put into a four-year degree? What does uh, an upholstery technician make and how much... Uh, you know, schooling do you acquire for that? So that that those baseball cards are creating a lot of energy, especially with the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. So it's there's no magic bullet. We're just throwing everything we can at these kids to create some interest, and we are seeing movement in, um, especially the high school guidance uh, counselors encouraging kids to look at technical education um, if it fits them. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I just have a quick statement. First and foremost, uh, we have some incredible industries in this state, and Gulfstream is one of them, and really appreciate Jay and Mark's partnership and really investment into the economic prosperity of each citizen in this state. Uh, they're doing that even beyond this area. They're reaching out into the Coastal Pines area and, and starting up things in that area. But when you look at specifically the apprenticeships, as you were asking earlier, I just want to thank uh, you guys and also the governor for the investment. Uh, for years, uh, TCSG received some federal Title I money that helps us with apprenticeships, the U.S. DOL apprenticeships. But in recent legislative cycles, uh, this body and the governor um, provided state funds in the amount of about $1.2 million to help with apprenticeships for industry to actually be paid to go into, in into apprenticeships. So it's changing the mindset of those that haven't dipped their toes into it yet. And then the governor, through the grants that came down, gave an additional $4 million on top for additional training for those that are going into apprenticeships. So I believe we are changing that per perception of apprenticeships, the perception of which pathways are out there. And it's truly making a difference from uh, the governor's support, industry support, and specifically y'all support in the appropriations process. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Other questions for Jay or Mark? Seeing none, gentlemen, thank you again for your great work and service. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, next from our Georgia Ports Authority, uh, Lee and Stacy, you want to come on down? We always get to brag on all the wonderful activity and things coming through our ports, and we're looking forward to hearing from you this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, committee. Uh, my name is Stacy Watson. I'm the director of economic and industrial development for the Georgia Ports Authority, and I've been with the Georgia Ports for a little over 30 years. So I've been there to witness the incredible growth that we've had um, over that time period. Um, we are actually the fastest growing port in the nation um, over the fa past 15 years, and workforce. From a commercial standpoint, if we're going to continue that growth, if we're going to continue to be a successful port, and again, from a commercial standpoint, it's one of the most important aspects that actually feeds our growth at the, at the Georgia ports. Um, won't get into all these numbers. I'm sure you've seen them before. But the economic impact of the Georgia ports statewide, um, 
I mean, is significant. Um, and these are uh, third party numbers. They were done for us by the Terry College of Business, go dogs. Um, <laughs> 561,000 jobs and 3.3 billion in state and local taxes. So what I'm gonna talk about for a minute is just the continued growth that we see, the continued investment that we're going to make into our port and relate that back to workforce development and job creation. All right, this particular slide shows us our world ranking in 2006. We were the number 46 port in the, in the world. So definitely a world-class player as well as a national player and as of calendar year 22, we are the number 27 port in the world, okay? There are only three ports that are in the top 30 uh, worldwide ports as far as container throughput, container, th container throughput through, uh, through our uh, facilities, and that is New York, New Jersey, LA Long Beach, and Savannah. So we are actually in uh, good company with those two gateways. Uh, we're actually growing our market share as well. Not only do we watch you know, the number of containers that we move through our facilities, but what is that percentage and how is it growing according to our competitors, according to, uh, com in comparison to other ports around the country? And you can see FY14, we were 7.8% of all the market share of all U.S. ports, and today we're about 11.5%. So again, the fastest growing port in the nation um, over the fast, past 15 years, and we plan to grow. Uh, right now, our capacity at the Garden City Terminal is about 7 million TEUs, 20-foot uh, containers. And by the end of this year, uh, we'll have a capacity of about 7.5 million containers. And we're doing just under 6 million 20-foot containers right now. So through all of these plans, you know, we've got Ocean Terminal, uh, uh, which we're converting to a 100% container facility. Uh, we've got some additional property that we bought in Garden City to add to our uh, Garden City terminal capacity. Uh, we're actually building a transload facility uh, on the terminal. So we plan to take that capacity up to about 10 million TEUs or 20-foot containers by our fiscal year uh, 2026. And that's an important number because as of today, New York, New Jersey, that port gateway is doing about 9.5 million containers. The LA Long Beach uh, facility separately, uh, they're doing about nine and a half million containers on an annual basis. So we plan to grow and be into that class of, uh, of, of terminal, that class of Port Authority, along with the top two, actually that number three gateway. Okay. And again, this is just a repeat of, of what I just said. Current capacity, actually a little more than six and a half million TEUs. By the end of 2026, 7.5, and by the end of fiscal year 26, about 10 million TEUs. This is our spend. This is the Georgia Ports Authority spend um, as far as how we're going to increase that capacity. These are the costs. Uh, right now, with current spending with our, in our current budget in, under construction right now is about $1.8 billion that we're investing into our facilities. Okay. Over the next 12 years, we're going to invest about 4.5 billion in our facilities. Outside the terminal gates, very important for us. Uh, 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 again, workforce, not just for the Georgia Ports Authority, but for the entire logistics industry in the local area, very, very important. If a warehouse cannot staff their distribution center adequately, if they cannot have three shifts, if they can only have one shift, that affects their, their their routing decisions. They may not put that freight, all the freight that they can through the Savannah Gateway. They may go to a Charleston or they may go to a Jacksonville and then that threatens our standing um, as far as increasing our market share around the country. And outside the terminal gates, um, as you know, the warehouse industry is, is hot right now. We're actually seeing a lot of construction. There's actually a little under, a little over 40 million uh, square feet that's under construction right now. And not only are we the fastest growing port over the last 15 years, but we're the fastest growing industrial market um, of our size over the past two to three years. So we're about 105, 110 million square foot market in the Savannah area. And again, there's more demand. It continues to grow. Uh, vacancy has been fairly low over the past few years. We're seeing a slight rise in the vacancy of warehouse distribution center space um, outside the gate. Right now it's about 3.6%, but I can tell you 
with what I do on the economic development side, there is a lot in the pipeline that's coming our way. Um, this is a quick statistic on our import volume, our import containers and warehouse occupancy. And you can see it is a one-to-one -one correlation. So as the port grows, so does the need for warehouse distribution center space outside of our terminal gates. And that translates into more positions, more jobs that are going to be, uh, that are going to be needed uh, to fill those warehouses. So definitely a direct correlation. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention is that um, we've looked at um, um, some of the issues especially on the warehouse distribution center side and what we need to address and how we need to grow. We've mentioned uh, uh, attracting kids, uh, uh, junior high school, elementary school, definitely a focus for us. Um, and Lee is gonna talk about that uh, just after I speak, but we've also looked into what's called externships, actually working with parents, working with teachers, making them more aware of the logistics industry and the opportunities that exist for young people to get involved. We have to promote the logistics industry as a career, not just a job. Yes, you may start in a warehouse, but you can get into a forklift. You can become a supervisor. You can actually you know, get an electronics degree or an electronics diploma and work on the equipment. So that promotion of logistics as a career path, very, very important for us, as well as getting the parents involved and getting the actual local community and those teachers involved and helping us with that effort. So Lee, you had a few, uh, few things to add? So uh, several folks have mentioned some alternative ways of finding new employees. Uh, the Georgia Ports Authority started a program a few years ago called the YES program, where we're hiring kids straight out of high school. Uh, they have to be 18 years old, um, and at 18, we, we have them for an entire year. We train them on how to operate a forklift, how to drive a truck on terminal. Uh, they get a mentor. They, they're taught all of the soft skills that, that we expect. We train them for an entire year. Uh, today's YES program employees, uh, they start off at $21 an hour, full benefits, um, and then after about a year, they're set free to work on their own. They, of course, already have that mentorship relationship, um, and they get about a 50% bump, uh, you know, on their, on their hourly pay. Uh, and then, of course, that doesn't include all the overtime that they're going to be getting as well. Uh, one of those participants uh, started with us in the first class. His name is Jamel. He's currently a crane operator, making about $100,000 a year. Um, he is 22 or 23 years old, has purchased his own home, has no student loan debt. Right. Uh, and if he wants to go back to college, we have a tuition reimbursement program prepared for him. Uh, so trying to think outside the box. Uh, we have a longstanding um, uh, tradition at the port of, of finding new ways to do things better. Um, Stacy didn't mention this, but he actually started as an intern at the Port Authority <laughs> 31 years ago. Um, so uh, hiring outside the box, and, and obviously that's paid off pretty well for us. Um, so we, um, you know, we have a lot of demand for our, to, to operate our own facilities. So we're trying to find unique ways to bring in employees. But it's also, you know, our success is built upon our customers. And we've got right. to make sure in our community that we're able to uh, find employees for folks that we're bringing in. Um, and, you know, if, if they can't find employees to, to work their warehouses, work their manufacturing facilities, then that hurts us and our credibility as well. So uh, what y'all are doing is, is, you know, key to our success, our continued success, and so we, we just really appreciate y'all. Yes. Thank, Thank you. And Stacy, uh, I want to follow up on a question with you. You talk about promoting logistics, which I think is a, an excellent idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and starting, uh, obviously, in whatever position it is, I think we have to tell those stories. Just a few months ago, we lost uh, Oz Nelson, uh, who actually relocated UPS to Atlanta years ago. He's a good friend of mine, a fraternity brother. Mm -hmm. And Oz started washing trucks for yes. UPS, mm -hmm. right, and became the chairman and CEO of uh, one of the largest companies on the planet. I think we have to tell those stories. Tell the stories about yourself, who started as an intern, and the work that you do today. And I think uh, it was brought up by uh, Jay and Mark with Gulfstream. I think we even need to start younger than that. I think we need to bring third graders through more uh, tours of the poor understanding. And I guess the question also comes to promoting, are you, even though I, I dislike a lot of what comes out of social media, are you yes. doing any advertising or telling stories to, to target the young folks through social media and other means? Yes, most definitely we are. We've actually hired uh, this last year a workforce development manager, Tanya Chisholm. 
and that is her job, and this is a job that we have never had at the port, to work with the school systems, to work with our corporate communications team, to work with any stakeholder that may be able to help us attract employment within the Georgia Ports Authority. So yes, we look at all avenues as well. Yeah, you know, I know a lot of the uh, younger folks, especially, you know, YouTube is one of their main sources yes. of, of watching things, and I think we have to get some of the stories and excitement out there. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a treasure work that you all are doing with the ports, and uh, it's always exciting to see them ever growing. Are there questions from the committee members for either Stacy or Lee? Mr. Chairman. Yes. Danielle, please. Uh, yeah, CDL drivers is, is uh, you know, constant uh, demand, um, you know, for, for not just our industry, but, but you know, agricultural industry. Uh, so it's spread throughout the state, throughout several different sectors. Um, we work real closely here locally, uh, particularly with our local um, uh, technical colleges, uh, both here in Savannah and in Brunswick. Um, recently, we, we supported the, an, an initiative to get some funding uh, to expand the, uh, the the CDL training, um, both in Effingham and in, in Chatham County. I um, understand that they both they got that funding, so we're excited about that. Uh, but there's a constant demand for that. Um, nationally, there is a truck driver shortage, um, and um, and so you know we've got to find a way to to beat our our peers at getting you know those folks in place and and um, you know trained yep. up. Uh, there are a number of, of, of other initiatives that kind of hurt uh, some some federal issues with uh, allowing folks to drive across state lines. Um, you know, we certainly voiced that in Washington with our with our delegation. Yep, and one of the things is lowering the age. I think the age for a CDL is 20 or 21. You drive across uh, state lines, it's 21. Yes. Uh, so yes. if someone comes straight out of high school and they want to be a truck driver, you uh, miss the opportunity. They they have to wait three years before they can drive you know, right. their state. Uh, and with us being so close to the state of South Carolina, uh, state of Florida, there's a lot of demand for, for cargo to go from Savannah, certainly to those states and, and you know, further inland as well. Right. That's an that's a excellent point. Uh, Haley, as we're continuing to take some copious notes on what will be future recommendations, I, I think we need to capture that as well mm -hmm. as how we're going to continue, not, not just for what you're doing at the ports, but as a state to get to more messaging to our youth. I think that's important. One last thing that has uh, been, been brought up a couple of times uh, in discussions throughout this year has been, uh, you know, during the pandemic, the younger age bracket of the baby boomers kind of retired in mass. At the mm -hmm. time, the stock market was high, uh, inflation was low, uh, life right. was seeming a little bit too short at that time, and we lost what was really probably the, the most experienced uh, and certainly more the, the most uh, accountable and responsible part of the workforce at one time. Uh, and a lot of those folks took Social Security early at 62. Yes. And what most of us know is if you take Social Security early, you will get penalized if you make more money uh, mm -hmm. than uh, what the cap happens to be. And although we cannot control that as a state, hopefully through sway through our federal counterparts, uh, I have asked them to try and uh, look at suspending that for maybe the next five years for anybody who, who took early Social Security because we want and need them to come back to the workforce, whether it's full-time or even part-time. Uh, we could, we could sure, certainly use them, and I think with uh, the market's not quite what it was a couple years ago and inflation has put a burden on many people, they probably need that opportunity to come back to work. Yes. Okay, other questions from the committee members? Thank you for your great presentation. Thank you. And we're going to continue to move on. We'll hear from the Georgia Restaurant Authority. Are we going to have Scott and Jamie come on down? While you're walking down here, one of our committee members, Ryan Pernice, uh, who is a restaurateur himself, unfortunately could not make this committee meeting today, but I know he's going to be following up with us online and obviously has an active interest and works closely with the GRA. Good morning. Thank you all for having us here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for, for having us out. You know, this is a, 
um, important topic for the restaurant industry. Um, I'm Scott Beerman, the VP of Government Affairs at the Georgia Restaurant Association, and with me today is Jamie Dern. He's sitting back next to the chairman. Um, he's the managing partner of Daniel Reed Hospitality here in Savannah. Uh, I'm going to go over a few data points regarding the industry and kind of some of the workforce development uh, items we're working on as an association. And then uh, Jamie's going to come up and talk about some things kind of on an operator level. You know, our industry was hit hard during COVID. We lost a lot of uh, great restaurants. Folks, folks had to uh, shut down. Um, now, we are bouncing back, though. As you can see here, we have about 20,000 eating and drinking places in Georgia, coming around over $30 billion in sales. Um, Closer to 22, 23,000, but the estimates can bounce around a little bit based on openings and closings, just the way the economy works out. In those 20,000 locations, we employ um, over 500,000 Georgians, which is about 10% of the uh, total employment in the state. And this doesn't include, you know, includes obviously dishwashers and bussers and chefs and sous chefs, but also includes folks like um, food safety experts, food scientists, real estate developers, uh, marketing staff. The list is long, I'm sure. when when um, Jamie gets up here, um, he can talk about some of the folks in his organization who wouldn't fit the traditional mold um, as you think of a restaurant employee. And Ryan probably could do the same if he were here. On the next slide here, it points out some of the, uh, some of the breakdowns via, by congressional district. You can see obviously the fifth congressional district being downtown Atlanta, um, having the highest concentration. But even here in Savannah, um, there being quite a big number. Um, and you can see here how much is, uh, um, added to the uh, economy when folks spend money in restaurants. As, as you know, when things are being developed, you know, putting in new building developments, new town center type areas, they want restaurants to come in and serve as the foundation of those because those attract people in and it adds money into the economy. A little bit of background about our workforce and our ownership. And, I, and this is an interesting, these are a couple interesting numbers I really want you guys to remember as we talk about this a little bit more. 80% of our restaurant owners and 90% of our managers started out in entry level positions. We're talking dishwashers, bussers, greeters, just their first jobs. This is where they started out. So you can see a clear path here of folks coming into the industry young, sticking around and making something of their own. And I also want to point out here at the bottom of this past point, on the podium might be in the way. Across the country, the, uh, the um, wage for a, for a full service wait staff member is about $27 an hour, and that's just the median number. I mean, we've seen folks make $50, $60 an hour at some of the finer di dining establishments. You can make a really good living as a wait staff. And again, those are the paths that we see folks getting in and moving up to become owners, managers, and things along the way. In Georgia, we're really proud of our diver diversity in the industry. 55% of our restaurants are minority owned, which puts us at number four in the nation. 31% are African-American owned, which puts us number two only to Mississippi. We are, you know, 46% of our restaurants are majority owned by women, um, which actually puts us tied at the top again with Mississippi, and those numbers obviously fluctuate. Uh, we, we take the lead, they'll mount, they'll take the lead, so we go back and forth. But that 46% number um, compared to the nationwide average of 34%, we stand out above the rest of the country. Really quickly on a national level, um, and this kind of tr trickles down to the state, we are still seeing a, a staffing shortage. We're about 80,000 jobs um, short of where we were before COVID and over a million job openings across the country. You know, some of that will come down here. We're one of the bigger states when it comes to rest the restaurant industry. 62% um, of the operators, um, let me show here, 62% of the operators don't have enough staff. Um, You've, I'm sure you've all been in, you may have done it this week, you've walked into a restaurant and said, hey, there's an hour wait, but you can see tables in the back. We hear from our restaurant tours across the, across the state who go, we just don't have enough staff. We don't, we wanna fill these tables. We wanna have people in. We just don't have enough staff to do it. And 87% of those people will say, if we can find good staff, we are gonna hire more. We're gonna add on to what we already have. Saying all that, um, you know, the Georgia Restaurant Association through our foundation in partnership with the Georgia or the National Restaurant Association Foundation, we're trying to find a path to bring qualified folks into the industry and we target high school folks through our Pro Start program. Uh, it's a two year culinary arts program. It does a lot and it teaches kids about, you know, what the, the basics of being in a kitchen, what that's like. Go some of the serve safe training. Hey, how do you get um, food? What's the safe way to handle food? You know, how do you look out for um, 
unconscious bias? How do you prevent uh, instances of, of sexual harassment in the, in the workplace? Kids, things that these kids need to know. But we also teach them about professionalism. We teach them about time management. Teach them about ways to come into an industry, be it the restaurant industry or some other industry, and take those principles across. We also go, you can see a little bit more here of kind of what's been doing. I think the serve safe is a, a big point there. Um, we want our folks who go into the kitchens. We're very, we're very passionate about food safety. We want our kids to know when they go from high school into the kitchen, they know how to handle food safely. And so we drill that into them to make sure that they're going to come in prepared. But we take it a step for, further, and one thing that we really work on is a program called Fulton Connect. It's a partnership through the Fulton Education Foundation and the United Way. It's a series of boot camps. So we're asking these kids to come on a Saturday. And so we're grabbing the kids who are really passionate about being in the industry. Again, we build on what they've learned on in the Pro Start program in their in their day to day classroom. We talk about knife skills. We talk about how to prep a proper meal, things along those lines. But we go a little step further. And we try to really grab onto those soft skills. We talk about showing up on time. How do you get your social security card? How do you fill out a tax form when you get there? How do you fill out a job application? These things that you're learning the technical side of being in a kitchen, but you're also learning the things you need to be successful as a career. Because we don't want our kids to do all this work, get a job, show up day one, and they can't start because they can't fill out the paperwork. We want them to know exactly what they need to get into the classroom and get into the workforce right away. But I think the most important part of all of this as we talk to our high school students is just giving them the confidence and knowledge they need to step into the industry. You know, I know the kitchen, um, can be intimidating. It can be, you know, you, the, all the fire and the, the knives out everywhere. It can be intimidating step in the, stepping in there. We want to give them the confidence that they can step in and know, I belong in this place and I can step in. You know, with 500,000 jobs across the state, we are a large industry. We're one of the biggest in, in the state. You know, ag is at the top, but we take their food, we take their product, and we cook it up and give it to you. And we have a place for these folks to come. And we want to point to them. I want to go back to the 80, 90 percent numbers. That the 80 percent owners, 90 percent um, managers, had their start in the restaurant industry. This shows them you can make a good living and you can make something on your own through this industry and through what we can provide. So that's from a, kind of a big picture area. What we're looking at. I'm going to turn it over to Jamie to come up and talk about some of the local and the operator level stuff, and then I'll close this out. How's everybody doing today? A little younger then, but don't count on that. Uh, so first 22 and a half years of my life was um, spent in, the, in the farming. I grew up on a farm, working farm about an hour from here. So farming, agriculture being uh, the number one employment uh, in the state, you know, that drives uh, employment in the state. I've got a lot of experience on that side. And the other 22 and a half uh, years of my life have been in the restaurant business. Um, I want to just sort of touch on what the restaurant business is. I know there's a lot of emotional things that come up when you think about a restaurant, maybe anniversary or birthday or just having a wonderful night out with your friends. But to me, a restaurant is, uh, is a manufacturing business. Uh, we are the largest manufacturing business in the state. We are the second largest employer in the state. So when you walk into the halls of our restaurant in the morning at the public at 8 o'clock in the morning, there is just boxes and boxes of raw material stacked up the ceiling and it's incredible to watch the team come in um, and start putting away those things and, and making that work for us during the day. We bring in raw materials every morning, we break them down, we sell them for a profit, we start over the next day. So think about restaurants as a manufacturing business. Um, on the agricultural side of it, you know, having spent so many years of my life driving a mile an hour down a tobacco field or picking up dead chickens in chicken houses, um, we are an industry that is just tied to so many other things uh, in the community. Um, farming, obviously, is very close to me. And uh, I think that as a state, we've got to be very careful also about our rhetoric and the way that we attract other people to move to the state. It needs to be a welcoming, um, a welcoming state. And we need people to move out of town, right? And we need farmers. My, in fact, my my nephew just quit farming. He's 22 years old, and it's all he wanted to be was a farmer. Uh, but he had to actually sell all of his farming equipment last year and go work at an HVAC company to make money because he cannot make a living as a farmer, as a small farmer anymore. And a lot of that is tied to, um, is tied to employment. You've got, um, 
you know, the, if you live on a farm or you work in a restaurant or own a restaurant, which I never say I own restaurants, they own me. Somebody asks me how many restaurants I own, I say they own me. I never tell them how many. Um, but things break constantly. And on the farm, you don't hire a, an electrician or a plumber or an HVAC person. You do it all yourself. I mean, I knew how to wire electric when I was seven years old, you know, as the, the soft skills I learned on a farm. Um, but even whenever Ridge went out to go get a tractor tire fixed or something that he needed that he couldn't do, the parts weren't available because the drivers can't get the parts from the ports to, you know, to Statesboro. Uh, so it's a, it's a big problem all the way around. Um, lastly, I just want to sort of be the voice also for the small business. Uh, I mean, obviously, ports, love it. Gulfstream planes, who doesn't love that? Um, I, I guess I would ask anyone on the committee, um, does anyone have a, any, any idea of what percent of small business in Georgia employing under less than 300 people? Does anybody know that statistic? So if you don't know that statistic, I think that's an important one to know. I, I would probably wager to say that if you look at uh, businesses that are 300 or less, which is cons considered what some consider small business, um, I, I would probably say 95% or more of the state of Georgia is small business. So while you're doing your work, trying to figure out how we're going to retain and, uh, and, and get employees to move to our state, you also need to focus on the big things, but really you need to focus on the small things. How does an operator like me or a mom and pop restaurant um, bring talent to our restaurant and then retain it? I'll tell you that um, you know, keeping up with a small business, if anybody here has owned a business, it's tough and it's hard work. And if you're a single operator or maybe have one or two locations in the restaurant business, uh, you are pulled in so many different directions all the time. And um, I know that many of you probably know Indeed. I know I'm running out of time. I'll be quick here. But um, <clears throat> my partner was screaming at the, at the TV the other day. And I ran in there. I'm like, what the hell's going on in here? And he was so angry because Indeed was talking about how to find that perfect job from home, you know? We don't need to be sending messages to people to work from home. We need people out, out in our communities working. So that needs to be a huge message for the state of Georgia. Um, I don't know if Georgia has a, um, I didn't look before I came, and the fact that I don't know tells me that probably 99.9% .9 of any future employee doesn't know. But Georgia needs a, a state-run uh, Indeed that is free to all employers of the state of Georgia, free for all of the employees of the state of Georgia to use. Um, it needs to be marketed, it needs to be known about, it needs to be robust. I'm spending $500 per week, per week now, to run one sponsored Indeed ad at one of my restaurants. That's $26,000 a year that's coming straight off the bottom line just to get people to come to the door. And even then, uh, you have to do that in several different capacities and keeping up with that as, as somebody that's working in the business as a, as a self-employed person is very, very, very taxing. And a lot of times um, we, we, we just miss the opportunities because we didn't have the time to do it. So my ask for, for you is to, uh, is to really get down to the nitty gritty and think about, you know, what really is going to work at the baseline level for everyone. So any questions or comments? Jamie, thank you, and, and to Scott as well. Uh, I couldn't agree more with you. Our small businesses are the lifeblood uh, of our state. And while we, we do uh, certainly love all of our, our large crown jewels as far as our big companies, um, we need to make sure we're giving the equal, if not uh, more attention to those that maybe doesn't have that large staff or, or capital outlet to do the things they need to do each and every day. And I think that's a real good point in working with uh, economic development and certainly tying in our technical colleges and universities. I think it's an excellent idea. Are there questions from the committee members for either of these gents? Good. Got a microphone right there. I actually, I'd like to make a comment. So. Uh, Certainly, I love talking about airplanes, so Gulfstream was awesome, and let, you know, talk about the ports, logistics is big in what we do. Uh, but Scott, you, you had a point on your slide, and you, you, didn't, you didn't comment on it, but I noticed it, and said 63% of folks work in the restaurant industry at some point in their lifetimes, and I imagine that percentage is getting less as time goes on, but if you think, of, you, you basically made the point, you said that that's the training ground. And right now, as we're hiring staff, I get people that Delta Airlines is their first job. And it's not a great experience, honestly, as an employer to break somebody in with, have to teach them professionalism and the soft skills and the customer service and the commitment and the work ethic. So thank you for what you do. And I think we'd all be better served if we 
I found a way to encourage kids to start a little earlier, right, and not get that first job after college, but get that first job while you're still in high school. Right, so and, and I'll add on that, you know, I think we see a lot of our, a lot of our youth, their first job is in a restaurant or, you know, be it a Chick-fil-A, be at their parents' restaurant, be at one of the bigger brands. Um, yeah, we see it as a perfect training ground. Maybe not perfect, I'll take that back, but it's a great training ground to learn some of those things. You know, if you want people to come in and spend money in your restaurants and you want to continue to have folks come in, you need to be hospitable, you need to have people who are, have a smile on you. There's a reason that Chick-fil-A has, you know, high, high quality standards and, and have year after year, you know, those customer service surveys are always ranked high. And I think the industry as a whole can model off of that. And a lot of them do. I think Jamie's folks do. And uh, a lot of our restaurateurs, they take that to heart. You know, you don't get into this industry to make a ton of money. Um, it, the, the profit margins are not uh, astronomical. You get in because you like to serve people. You like to be hospitable. And I think that that's the common thread throughout our industry. And by showing that to our young folks who come in, go and either stay in the industry, move to the other industries. I think that's just that's a, a parent and can just something we can all build on. Wonderful. Right, we're going to continue with our agenda, but before we do, uh, raise your hand if you've ever worked in a restaurant in the food services industry. And there you have it, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Appreciate uh, Thank you your so time much. today. Okay, next up, uh, Daniel Defense. Bart, would you come on down and uh, speak to us here? Thanks for having us, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Bart. Uh, please. Appreciate to be here. I'd like to introduce a couple of folks I've got with me. Sean Pollard, who is our Director of EHS and Training, uh, and Donna Carter, who is our Director of HR. I Thank think you. The lifeline will call on them. Um, yeah, speaking of small businesses, so we're going to look through a kind of a different lens, uh, smaller business, kind of give you an update on where we are. Uh, just want to show you kind of a head count here. Um, Last year, kind of year to date this year, we've uh, seen from first part of 2022 to last latter part of 2022, we upped about 60 plus heads. We're down about 20, so this year it'll be a flat year for us. Um, we use about three temp services. Uh, that's typically how we, you know, enroll our folks. We'll have them as a temp anywhere from three to six months. Uh, and then hire them on as full time based on attendance and performance and business need. So we'll usually carry about 40 to 50 temps uh, around, the, around the year just for that purpose. Uh, we can only usually see out in our business, as you can imagine, it is a very volatile business depending on what's happening in the world. So about six months, we can have a pretty good idea of what's gonna happen uh, after that, it's, it's who knows. Uh, we've got about 32 positions open now. That, that typically ranges anywhere from probably 30 to 50. Um, and it takes us a long time, like I'm sure everybody else in the room is, to, to hire, hire 30 people. You're talking about not, not days, but uh, several weeks and months, depending on the role. So, uh, and we're scheduled, if we look out about three years from now, we're scheduled to probably double our, our hourly head count. So we've, right now we've got about 225 or so hourly so we're expecting to double that and then if we look five and ten years out we'll we'll continue that trend a lot of automation going on right now in our our, our uh, business uh, and and that's not obviously to take the place of our employees that's just to how do we get better and not be so dependent on labor um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this but uh, you know you'd ask us kind of talk a look take a look at a little bit about turnover and retention uh, you know Prior to COVID, uh, we were sitting right around that 10, 11 percent uh, turnover mark. We we're about 15 percent overall. We hit about 15 percent last year. We're on target to hit another about 15 percent this year. Uh, so, as you guys know, uh, folks will will move from one job to the other for 50 cents or less, uh, and it's uh, you know we've we've got the same issues and challenges as as everyone else in the room. It's uh, the, the shiny new penny across the road is uh, with the competitive wages. So we're constantly trying to figure out how we how we retain talent. We've got one of our organizational goals I'll mention is is become employer of choice. That can mean a lot of things in a lot of different uh, 
to a lot of different people, but uh, you know, a lot of that is just focused on what are we doing internally, what type of programs, what type of engagement, what type of interaction. Uh, somebody mentioned, you know, have fun in the workplace. So we've got a number of initiatives going on at Daniel Defense now uh, that will hopefully uh, pay dividends later. Uh, this just kind of shows you a little bit about what we've been doing over the last two or three years. Uh, a lot of it is repetitive as to what I've heard from other uh, employers. Uh, the things in green you'll see is probably the things that we've had the best luck with. Uh, and I think, you know, if you ask the folks that's been in the, uh, in the grit of it, we've tried most everything <laughs> that we know to try, and uh, we're, we're not ashamed to, to steal ideas from others. So... Um, I'll kind of talk a little bit about radio. It's probably been by far the, the best uh, ticket in terms of recruiting talent. Uh, done a lot with our marketing and social media. Um, we've done a lot with the school systems, uh, Effingham, Metter, Bryan County. We've got a lot of, a lot of good relationships uh, throughout Bryan County and the high schools. We did a lot of what many of you would said uh, probably two years ago. And we did it for the last actually a couple, three years is getting our, our grade school, middle school, high school students along with their parents to come in uh, and take a tour of the plant, let us talk to them about education, about career paths uh, within Daniel Defense, let them know and let the parents know more importantly that you know manufacturing is not this dark, dingy, bad place to work. It is, we've got a showcase plant, it shows well to, to potential uh, employees, it shows well to our customers. Uh, it's a state-of-the-art facility that we're very proud of, and um, you know, I think that's one way that we uh, have gained a lot of, of traction there. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, work-based learning programs. Um, we've got referral programs in place, uh, and we've got a really good relationship with Georgia Southern. Uh, we've got a Headed to Paulson program. We actually partnered with uh, Georgia Southern and started that program a couple years ago. And what that is is these are high school students that are earmarked. They're, they're going to enroll in Georgia Southern. They have enrolled to Georgia Southern uh, and earmarked toward the engineering program. So we get them uh, before we uh, begin them as a co-op, and we've got a really good co-op program with them as well. So that kind of stair steps them away through the process. They start out on the plant floor as a high school student gets into the Georgia Southern Engineering Program, and then we do three years typically with, with that co-op to just run them through the process. Uh, so that's been a really good program, really good partnership. We've also had with Savannah Tech, appreciate you guys' support. Uh, we just uh, formulated a partnership with Ogeechee Tech uh, with a lot of our automation uh, initiatives uh, that Sean and his team is working through. Um, so a lot of, lot of things, but uh, Again, just uh, labor shortages continues to be a challenge. Um, so recruiting challenges, um, again, a lot, of, a lot of what you guys have said. So, you know, we have, uh, we'll, we'll call it, it's almost like speed dating. We'll work through our staffing agencies and we'll have a, a kind of a speed dating event, if you will, and have 20, 25 folks to show up uh, for uh, that that event and we can count probably, you know, eight, 10 of those will just no show. Um, we've got uh, folks that unfortunately have a, have a difficulty passing drug, drug screens and background checks. Um, you know, heightened wage competition I mentioned early, uh, generation challenges. We've got shift patterns we run 24 seven. We've got weekend shifts. So, you know, not everybody is set out to work a 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. type shift on a, on a weekend. So, uh, but our, our folks run pretty much 24 seven and you know, most all of us, uh, they're no different than us. They like a, a day shift that they can come in and work seven to three, you know, eight to five and be home with their family. So uh, we've got a number of initiatives going on uh, beginning next year to try to figure out how we, how we structure our shifts to become more family friendly and uh, flexible options. Uh, and then remote work, uh, somebody mentioned that as well. We've, uh, during COVID, we was almost forced to, to get in type remote work situations. And uh, we finally got most of our folks back. Uh, and, but, you know, especially when we're hiring professional positions, one of the first things out of their mouth is, is, is it a remote job? Um, so that's gonna be, I think, be a challenge going forward. 
Uh, some of the training initiatives I mentioned with the Geechee Tech, Georgia Southern, uh, we've got some in-house uh, training that we do online, uh, especially with our skilled trades uh, folks. Um, Savannah Tech, Georgia Tech, they've, uh, we've partnered with them as well. I, th I think one of the requests, uh, I think this has been mentioned as well, one of the requests, and I've, I've been in various parts of Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, Texas, and in each one of those states uh, struggle and continue to struggle with the same issues we're talking today, especially in our, as it relates to skill trades. When you talk about maintenance, welding, uh, CNC operators, tool makers, programmers, those are the type of, of skills that we're sitting here saying that we need, we understand how to get them early, develop them. So if we can figure out a, a a feeder pool, I guess, if you will, to, to just continue having the, the structures in place and the curriculum in place to bring those kids through. Uh, I think that would serve us all well. So I think that's all I've got. Wonderful, Clark, thank Any you questions? so much for that presentation. Very helpful in your commitment to uh, the community and uh, hiring people and giving them good jobs. Uh, we have questions from the committee members. Uh, Senator Halpern, if we could just grab a microphone, Senator Estevez, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just a question. We've talked a lot already today about um, folks coming out and having that lack of basic soft skills. I noticed on your graph, though, that you also said that there was a lack of ability to pass a basic skills assessment. Would you just elaborate a little bit more on what it is exactly that's missing there? I'm, I'm going to call on Donna or Sean, either one. Uh, they can probably talk through that. It's, it's, it's basically just a very short. Um, so we, we take a look at a skill set. If I leave anything out here, you guys can add to it. But um, we give them a basic skill set and that skills test. And that test is based on kind of mirror what we're going to be asking them to do on the shop floor. So basic math uh, skills, uh, measurements, uh, reading, comprehension, following directions, et cetera. So, uh, and we basically are, are looking for a certain grade on that. So that is a knockout if they don't get a certain score on that. So um, what really triggered uh, the basic skills, which was about five years ago, we ran a pilot program. Uh, what triggered that is that we hired an individual that couldn't read. <clears throat> and so Daniel Finch, you've got uh, work orders and things to read that really feed the manufacturing process. So uh, we had uh, got a labor attorney involved uh, we, we talked about what are the different topics and subjects in the basic skills assessment that we would need. So, so reading comprehension, basic math, they're given a calculator, and there's some quality instrumentation. And, and so we utilize existing workforce. We started with the, the workers and, and the leaders, and, and then we had them take this basic skills test. It's 10, 12 questions uh, based at about the eighth grade level. And uh, we took all the results, and then uh, we had our labor attorney examine what those results were. And uh, we look for any uh, adverse impact, per se. We adjusted that a little bit, and uh, we did a round two. And so we finally uh, came to a, a good basic skills test that we felt was good for, for anybody walking through the door that was going to take on a manufacturing job um, that, uh, that, that was kind of a key indicator for us whether or not we move forward with the interview or not. Um, and then that was the first year. Every year we've taken all of the, the results year after year. Uh, we've had that analyzed with a labor attorney that we've, we hire and we, we're in uh, 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 communication with each and every year and, and to see if we need to adjust to make sure there's no adverse reaction or uh, impact. Uh, and, um, and so it's worked very well for us. Other questions? Bart, thank you so much for your presentation, your time today. We look forward to following up with you. Okay, next up with our military council, uh, Patrick and Emmeline. Good morning, everyone. I am Emmeline Hastings from the Army Community Service Employment Readiness Program. What um, we like to focus at, our, uh, at the Employment Readiness Program is about mostly our military spouses. We do also service our veterans, our retirees, um, other family members, and also our transitioning members. But right now what we do is we focus on our over 9,000 spouses within the Fort Stewart Hunter Army Airfield area. That being said, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of our spouses are considered 
what we would say um, under under recognized due to the fact that a lot of our spouses come back to me and say well I couldn't get a job because they say we have a job gap well <clears throat> to understand a lot of the job gap <clears throat> a lot of the job gap or they also say that the if you're a military spouse you won't be staying in our area very long however that's pretty much a, uh, a misnomer. When we talk about military spouses, their average stay in an area is three to four, uh, sorry, not three to four, four to five years in an area. In addition, a lot of our spouses are also have degrees, so about 34% of them have bachelor's degrees and about 15% have master's degrees. So to not be able to get a job is um, a little disheartening for a lot of them. There are also spouses out there who are extremely eager to go ahead and work for the local companies. Most, a lot of them that I have actually seen have been able to get at companies with, um, get jobs within, say, Gulfstream, um, the uh, Chatham County Sheriff's Office, and also with our local hospitals. But that's, again, a small amount. What we're looking at, what we do at Army Community Services to assist these spouses and the family members and the veterans is to go ahead and provide one-on-one -on -one, um, resume writing, resume writing reviews, resume writing skills. We also have provide classes on interview skills. We do uh, dressing for success. Um, we also go over career goal setting. Many of our spouses, after so many years of traveling and uh, working in just one industry from the past, they're also looking to go ahead and change their careers. So in that respect, if they're saying they were prior, they were prior military and, they're look, and they were doing logistics, they would like to go into the HR field. So we go into how do they get to the HR field now, okay? Um, what we also provide for them is a chance to go ahead and meet with the employers. We have a, a, a new, how can I put it? A new system, a new, a new event that we call uh, Ion Employment. Now Ion Employment itself is very unique to this area. Um, I have not really seen it too many in other bases I've been at. With Ion Employment, it's basically a weekly mini job fair. This provides not just the spouses, not just the veterans, but also our transitioning members to meet with the local companies and see the kind of talent that's out there that the military is providing. We also have different webinars um, and also hybrid events where they'd be online and in person that they can go and either meet with um, employers or also um, have classes in regards to resume writing, interview skills, and so on. We also uh, conduct uh, military spouse fairs, which some of the companies in this room have actually been at, and we do thank you for that. The companies that are getting to meet some of this talent and to be honest, military spouses, if they have taken, let's say, about a year sabbatical to go ahead and travel, to move from one base to another, they have never lost those skills. So it's uh, important to understand they don't lose the skills. They are there. It is, they are resources that need to be utilized by local companies, okay, wherever they go. So we make sure that they get to meet the, meet the companies that are out there. In addition, we actually partner with our transition assistance program with USO and so on. In the transition assistance program, which Mr. Bean will go ahead and uh, uh, review, is they have a program called, um, called TEAMS, which stands for Transition Employment Assistance Military Spouses. With that, they provide modules, um, same as what we provide in person over at, at Army Community Service. They provide modules on uh, resume writing, job search skills, interviewing, and so on. Okay. Um, but for more of that and more for more about the uh, Transition Assistance Program, I have Mr. Bean. Thank you, Stacey. So first of all, good morning to everybody. Good afternoon, Rana Dan. <clears throat> so before we get started, on behalf of General Nori, uh, the Garrison Commanders at Force Hill Hummer F here, uh, we, pre we appreciate the time to come and uh, discuss with you guys and offer up you guys some opportunities to understand how we can meet your workforce needs. First of all, and, <clears throat> and we're saying that, I'd be remiss to say this, and I gotta get it out the way. I'm a big football fan, so it is a pleasure and honor to see you, Mr. Champ. <laughs> I'm all with you, right? 
So I got it out the way. I'm feeling better now. Very few times you get opportunities to be the president of the Hall of Fame, so it's, it's definitely close to me. So with that being said, hey, uh, first of all, my name is Patrick Bean. I ran an Army Transition Program located at Fort Stewart Hummer Airfield. I retired after 26 years in the military. I was a retired field artillery command sergeant major, right? So I understand targeting. So my, my, my offer to each one of you is understanding precision targeting when we're talking about employment. Who are we targeting? But more importantly, how are you targeting? Okay? So I offer this question up to everybody. How are you communicating your employment needs, your employment demands to military service members and spouses? How are you doing it? I don't need, I don't need the answer, but I want you to think about it. And if you're not including the TAP social media, you're not including connecting with the TAP program, the programs we run here at Hunter, Fort Stewart, as well as Fort Benning, Fort Gordon, and Kings Bay, Georgia, I think you're doing yourself a disservice. Here's why. We have in Georgia, we have over 700,000 veterans residing right here in Georgia. Veterans, okay? 700,000 residing right here in Georgia. In the next few years, we're gonna have a half a million service members that's gonna separate our military forces. Georgia's one of the top 10 states that we recruit service members from. Top 10. So what does that mean to you? That means to you that the population, the employment demand that you're seeking, the supply is there. Your challenge becomes, again, how are you communicating? How are you communicating? What are we missing? What are you missing? How are we meeting in the middle to solve this workforce issue we have it? Okay, so I offer that challenge up to you first and foremost. <clears throat> so I appreciate you for uh, taking away all my homework. Glad, short time, get right to the point. I'm gonna offer up you some numbers. What we're doing across the TAP program is this. We're starting our soldiers to transition out 18 months prior. Most of them starting within the year time window. We're starting to inoculate that process of what transition look like. What are you gonna be when you grow up? What's next for you? That's what we're engaging our soldiers on. We're engaging our soldiers on what their current careers are, how did that career they're in, how it translates to the next career they're going. For those of you that didn't know, 50% of our soldiers with their specific military occupation specialty, they are not going to that, specific, that particular specialty when they separate, okay? One of the biggest misperceptions out there, <clears throat> I use law enforcement, not to pick on law enforcement. Most of our military personnel, law enforcement, they're not going to military law enforcement. They're not going. For various reasons, a lot of our soldiers come in under different particular MOSs, but they're going out for other opportunities. They're seeking other opportunities as well. I've listened to a lot of people communicate of who we're attracting, uh, the kids in high school and all that, all that stuff is great. Again, I offer you, how are we reaching and communicating to our service members that's transitioning? <clears throat> since 2020, since 2020, and on average, Fort Stewart is transitioning 3,000 service members. Hunter, on average, is transitioning five to 600 service members each year. Each year since 2020, Georgia gets approximately 2,000 service members from other installations that's coming back to Georgia to make it home, okay? So the numbers, the demand, the supply, the numbers is meeting the supply. My challenge is how we get my supply to meet your demand, but I need your help in making that happen, okay? <clears throat> we have career skills programs. I left uh, most, um, if I didn't get everybody's information, please feel free to send me an email. I'll pass the information on to you, but I left most of the panel members uh, a folder. A lot of our information is in there. The brochure is our program. I want to highlight our career skills programs. I heard a lot of people talk about apprenticeship programs and also the great stuff. We have what's called career skills programs. We have what's called skill bridge programs. Our career skills programs is organic to Fort Stewart and Hunter. We have 11, 12 platforms that's there. We have platforms right now that are training soldiers 18, excuse me, 180 days prior to them separating to go into different career fields. A lot of career fields in here right now, we have soldiers trained in logistics, we have soldiers trained in CDL, we have soldiers trained in skill trades, we have soldiers trained in IT, we have soldiers trained to be veteran service representatives, we have soldiers trained in an array of career skill fields right now. So once they separate, they're ready to go to work. I offer it up to you because here's what I challenge my team to tell all employees. You want to hire soldiers, we want you to sponsor our career skills programs, okay? We got a logistic demand. We have a logistic platform. We're training soldiers on logistics right now. 
We're training soldiers on forklift certification. We're training soldiers on logistics supply chain. We're training soldiers on that right now through our career skills platforms. Now here's the big one. What does it cost you? It costs you zero dollars. It costs you zero dollars. You know how much marketing costs you to communicate to a soldier? Zero dollars. You know how much hiring events cost for you to come engage our soldiers? Zero dollars. Because we're doing it all for you. We are setting this platform up because we want our soldiers to be successful when they transition. So that's why we're doing what we're doing. But we'll continue to meet, we'll continue to have the gaps there. And I've been talking to Maria, we have a lot of conversations. We go back and forth in great ways. And I always, say, I always use the conversation that it seems like the BMW mechanic. Every time we have events, I always use the BMW mechanic. I hate to pick on the guy, but <clears throat> I told the BMW mechanic one time, <laughs> Stayed around by four hours. <clears throat> Engaged a lot of soldiers. I said, so how many soldiers do you think you might be able to hire? He said, well, Mr. Bean, I got to try to figure this out, blah, blah, OK. Down the road, he told me to hire too many, nobody. He couldn't find what he's looking for, basically. So I was OK. So basically, your problem is this. Your BMW employer trying to hire a BMW mechanic. What you just missed is that we don't have BMW mechanics. We have light wheel vehicle mechanics, OK? They work on Oshkosh. They work with BMW mechanics. So what you have to understand is that you get an Army ASC certified mechanic that can be translated and converted to be a BMW mechanic, OK? So I say that to say, when you go back to your HR team, have the HR team look at things that we're teaching our soldiers. Inside your folder right now, we have things that's called uh, industrial competency models, right? So we talk, I heard soft skills. I heard a lot of stuff that's being said today. I will tell you, when you look at the industrial models, right, our soldiers bring to you five of them tier competencies already, okay? They're coming with soft skills. They're coming with technical skills. They're coming with advanced skills. They're coming with training. They're coming with certifications. There's no soldier in our formation that's not certified by the United States Army right now. For every plumber we have in the Army, the Army is certified. For every logistics specialist, the Army is certified. For every IT person, the Army has certified. For every particular MOS or occupation you could think about, our Army has certified that individual. So the challenge to you becomes, how do I meet this employment gap, this workforce gap? How do I make it happen? How do I get the soldiers I'm looking for? How do I get the people I'm looking for? What do I need? Is it within our formations? Yes, it is. How do I connect to it? I have to reach out. Who do I reach out to? Who's my point of contact? And what else, what else am I offering the TAP program? What is the TAP program missing? What, what are we missing? We, we have some internal studies. We, we kind of know some things we're missing. We have to work better at it. The CG is working what is on it. The Garrison Command is working what is on it. We, we, we understand that. There, that's, that. That are dynamics we can control. The things we can't control is the dynamic of how we get more than 35% of our soldiers to stay in Georgia. And that's where we need you guys' help at right there. Because we want to keep the soldiers transitioning. We want to keep most of them here because the jobs are here. The jobs are here. But I'm only one person. I'm only one person. And there's only so much I can do. And we're reaching out to you guys to help us meet in the middle. Sir, I'm subject to your questions. Uh, first, thank you for your incredible work and passion, both of you. Uh, I don't think there's anything we can do that's more important than to help out uh, our greatest heroes. And thank you for your service. Uh, we have, as a General Assembly, the last many years, uh, helped to work on uh, translating certifications and, and other uh, uh, training that people have had from other states as they've moved into Georgia for both uh, our active duty military as well as their spouses. Uh, and hopefully that's helping some as well as I just want to remind everyone here, we also exempted up to $37,500 of retirement uh, income from those who have served us in the military. So hopefully those are our two little pieces that are helping, but it sounds like to me that you've got an extraordinary program with TAP here, and we need to make sure we're connecting the dots for you uh, more than we have in the past, because we've got a lot of uh, folks that, that need help, and you've got uh, some of the best workers that could possibly want. And I think it's going to be our uh, task to figure out, as a, as a state, how can we facilitate making those connections better uh, and supporting the great work that you uh, and your team are doing. Are there questions from the committee members? A uh, question from Senator Halpern. We'll pass you a microphone. I have a question that I'm trying to figure out exactly how to ask. But we've talked a lot today about kind of 
getting kids started early and how do we enter people into careers kind of from high school. We've talked already today about you know, our baby boomers who've retired and that I, I'm wondering if there is a unspoken perception about our military member service members as they transition and, I, and so I I don't, I'm just gonna have to ask this question like this. I don't know how to phrase it differently. What is, just out of curiosity, the average age of a person who is transitioning out of the military back into the workforce? So, so you, got two, you got two populations up. Let, let's say uh, our soldiers that do not retire, on, on average, they're between 18 and 25. Mm -hmm. And then we got our soldiers that are retiring. So we're talking uh, 35 to 45. Mm -hmm. So we got two ranges of uh, individuals that are separating. But all young people, is <laughs> but all, all young, right? I mean, all in, in multiple different stages of their career path as it relates to the trajectory of an entire career with the need to be able to move on to the next stage. You're, you're correct, yes ma'am. But, but with each stage of that uh, career service, the development process is happening as well as advanced learning, as well as advanced skills, as well as a whole lot of things, as well as let's make it a career. Because at the end of the day, too, our warm is an institution that's seeking to employ as well, too. So at the end of the day, we have that, that wide range of uh, people that are separating at various ages. Uh, but uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't allow the perception and or uh, what we may perceive as perception uh, stray us away from how, meet, how we meet the challenges. I think we have to identify what the perceptions are, but more importantly, how we make the perceptions, we take them from being uh, rumors and make them facts. And I think that's where we all win at right there. You're welcome, man. Other questions? Thank you so much for your presentation today. We appreciate it. Sir, we'll look forward to following up. Yes? On behalf of Fort Stewart Harm Matthew, we appreciate your time. So much for life. Thank you. Okay, and our final presenter of the day will be uh, from Goodwill. Uh, Michael, Meredith, and Bill, if you would come on down. Good morning. I'm Michael Winkler, President and CEO for Goodwill of Southeast Georgia. And with me today, I have uh, Meredith Champagne, our Vice President of Strategy, and Bill Kel uh, Kelso, our uh, Vice President of Mission uh, Advancement. And they're the really smart folks in the room, so they'll be helping me stay on point here. So um, um, it's a real pleasure to be here. We are one of 155 local and autonomous Goodwills from around the country. Our Goodwill is responsible for 29 counties here in southeast Georgia, from Savannah down to Cam Camden County, out to Ware County, uh, Vidalia, and up to Screven County. So we cover a wide catchment area, and our um, organization operates with three other Goodwills within the state. We define ourselves as a social enterprise, and the reason that we uh, refer to ourselves as a social enterprise is because we're 98.5% self-sufficient. Our programs, um, most of you are probably familiar with a little thing called our Goodwill Thrift Stores. Uh, I'm here today to talk to you about the story behind the stores, but between our stores, our manufacturing operations, and our business service operations, we provide um, jobs to over 680 individuals currently. By the end of the year, we expect to be at near 750 associates in Southeast Georgia, and our operating budget this year will exceed $44 million. So we are a fairly complex, fairly large workforce development organization. I'm gonna repeat that because everybody knows our stores. We are a workforce development organization. Since our founding in 1902 in Boston, Massachusetts, we have always been a workforce development organization. What we do is we help individuals with challenges and obstacles to sustainable employment achieve their career goals, achieve their work and employment goals, and hopefully achieve the American dream. So how do we do that? We do that in, with three pillars of operation. We do that with support services that we provide to all of these individuals. Most of the individuals that we serve have multiple barriers to sustainable employment. 
We also provide educational opportunities through a wonderful partnership that we have with the TCSG locally here with Savannah Technical College, Ogeechee Technical College, and Coastal Pines Technical College. In fact, to date, we've already awarded $31,000 in scholarships to individuals that we serve in Southeast Georgia to attend the technical colleges for credentialing. And then the final piece of it is we are a labor exchange organization. So not only do we hire individuals with challenges and obstacles to work within our three programs, but we also help place a, the majority, frankly 75% of the individuals that we place are placed in the community with local area businesses that we partner with. So who are the people that we serve? I'm gonna turn it over to Meredith. We serve many people through different contracts. So within Southeast Georgia, we are a provider to serve uh, Georgia Vocational. We also work with the Veterans Administration, their Employment and Training Divisions. We also work with the Department of Family and Children's Services, helping individuals receive it public assistance to gain employment and skills training to help break that cycle of poverty. And the majority of those individuals that we see through what we call our opportunity centers are self-referrals or coming in through our community partners, whether that's through the housing authority or other social service agencies. And so some of the trends that we are seeing with individuals is they're not just unemployed, 50%, they're underemployed. So the 65% that we're looking at there is the um, federal poverty level for a house of one. That's roughly 14,500 or less in income into their house annually. And so we're looking at how we can break that. So as we're looking at educational opportunities and ways to break that cycle, we're looking at the 15% that do not have a high school <coughs> diploma. What we do know is those who have a high school diploma versus those who don't earn 37% more annually just from gaining that. If they gain stackable credentials from a technical college system, they can earn up to 56% more annually within the environment. And as some of these individuals we are serving are also parents, we know that 50% of our students are more likely of parents who dropped out to be 50% more likely to drop out themselves. So we're definitely looking for ways to serve the community in very meaningful ways, not just to get them employed, but get them that sustainable wage to help them move out of poverty and be able to thrive. So we're not only workforce development, but we're workforce development with the purpose of breaking generational poverty and helping individuals through to a better pathway to success. So what are the challenges? You all are here to hear about the state of workforce development and what the challenges are ahead. The, when I'm asked in the community by community leaders what keeps me up at night, this is what keeps me up at night. The challenge that we have in our community and the fact of the matter is we have thousands of individuals here in Southeast Georgia that although we are seeing an unprecedented economic boom in our community, there will be thousands of individuals that currently uh, um, subsist uh, in our community. And the truth of the matter is, should we not be able to provide education and a pathway forward for those individuals to take advantage of this economic boom, they will be left behind. That's what keeps me up at night. And that's what we're really focused in on today as the modern goodwill, if you will. Uh, we're really focused in on helping individuals with challenges and obstacles that really involve uh, educational deficits, remediation. There's a number of different ways you can define it, but these are individuals that lack a high school diploma or have barely graduated from high school and really lack the academic prowess to be successful at not only the technical college or a four-year institution, but going to work as an apprentice in a job directly. So here to talk about what we're doing about that is Bill Kelso. So two slides to bring it home, and then I turn it back to you. Um, Senator Mallow, your timing was perfect. Uh, as he came in, I was thinking, where is the center? So I could point him out. We are, Goodwill was asked to participate um, through uh, the senator who is the community quarterback for the Savannah United um, purpose-built community uh, initiative off Wheaton Street, uh, modeled after Eastlake, and we, we know the success of Eastlake. Eastlake Foundation was actually brought down years ago by uh, some visionary folks to work with this community to really focus on this Wheaton Street corridor. And so uh, Goodwill is um, um, prepared uh, to join the YMCA in a joint venture focused on this property right here. 
that's 40,000 square feet uh, through a joint venture with the YMCA. Uh, and the vision is uh, Goodwill would be upstairs, uh, not with the store, uh, but with uh, adult ed, uh, our opportunity centers, um, all the services that we currently provide and more uh, down the road. Um, all of this is happening again because of uh, leaders like Senator Mallow, uh, who, um, with the work with the county, found some um, SPLOS dollars to build an early uh, learning center. Uh, and that's what his focus uh, is going to be on, uh, as well as um, the grounds, a library, and other development around, sandwiched in between brand new elementary school just up the road. Um, you've got East Broad, which is uh, providing, still providing educational services, and continued look at what um, uh, housing looks like uh, in this area. We're excited to be a part, also because Randy's Barbecue is still there and probably will remain there. The point being is, being a part of this project uh, is, it fits beautifully with our mission, which is serving a community, uh, particularly the 31404 uh, zip code, um, which has needs um, and is a community that um, uh, is desperate, but more so deserving for this kind of redevelopment and we simply want to be a part. Um, my understanding, and as I read the task of this committee as I wrap this up is, you know, so what do solutions look like? This isn't new. I want to thank the Senate for your support. Uh, and, and my comments are not about last year's uh, Senate Bill 112, but I do thank the Senate for their support. Um, when we look at solutions, we heard a lot throughout all the presentations, and well done everybody, but about youth and, and getting youth through the pipeline and into the kind of um, post-secondary uh, opportunities, apprenticeship programs, uh, particularly through the technical college. Absolutely. Spent 30 years in higher ed. Um, certainly understand um, that. But it is our adult learners, many who uh, Commissioner Frankly would never come to Armstrong back in the day uh, or come to you now that Michael just talked about that um, need a pathway. And so the model that comes out of Indianapolis, Indiana, the Excel Center, uh, which we've talked about at length, is focused on a, uh, an in-person adult high school uh, concept, publicly funded with the RAP services to help remove those key barriers that are keeping them from being successful in the classroom, but most importantly, feeding them into those stackable programs and the, regionally speaking, those kinds of um, uh, apprenticeships or other opportunities armed with that high school diploma that allow them to be um, economically successful. Um, and so with the Excel Center as an example, there are other examples out there. The challenge is, is from a public policy standpoint, uh, working with business um, and, and, uh, and corporations, but also looking for philanthropic solutions. Um, there's real opportunity to also help the older adult rise in a time when there's lots of opportunities out there. That's the end of my comments. No, thank you. Uh, that was uh, both inspiring and enlightening. I, I will count myself as one of those uh, people that uh, only knew that was where I got to drop off and donate some good things, and there was the store. So clearly there's some uh, incredible work that you're doing, not just here, but I'm sure across the state and nation. Uh, again, I think this is another area we've got to connect the dots because the programs you have are truly extraordinary. And uh, I think that's where we can really help people with what I like to call a hand up versus a hand out long term because we want to help teach people to fish uh, and be sustainable and then hopefully go back and, and help others. So, uh, Michael, you and your team are doing a phenomenal job here uh, and obviously the work with uh, Senator Mallow as well. Are there questions from the committee members? Oh, it was so good. You don't even have any questions. Well done. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Committee. We appreciate your time today. Thank you. All right. We're going to begin closing out the meeting here. First thing I want to do, though, is I want to take a special uh, thank you or say a special thank you uh, to Lee Hughes, his wife Amy, and their son Jensen who work together with Hughes Public Affairs. Uh, I will tell you, uh, nobody has been a bigger champion for Savannah and the coast of Georgia uh, than Lee and Amy and, and what they do, uh, really unmatched uh, for serving all of us. So thank you for everything you did to put this together. Uh, we could have done it without you. 
I want to remind people that our next meeting will be coming up. We'll be meeting at the, the Kia plant uh, out in West Point, Georgia. That is going to be on August the 22nd. Uh, we will have more information and specifics available on the website. Uh, if you, uh, again, interested in being a speaker, we are filling those slots up quickly. Uh, please reach out, let us know, or submit us your testimony by the website or by email. Uh, this was a great meeting. We have learned a lot. I'm going to ask the committee members that if you have any specific thoughts or ideas for the report, to please get those over to Haley sooner than later. And what I've found in doing these over the many years is we hear lots of good ideas and then we get to the fourth or fifth meeting and, and you're trying to remember what we did in those first couple meetings. The quicker we get those over to her to capture, we'll make it that much better and informative as we come up with that final report here uh, later in the year. Are there any uh, final questions or comments from the committee members before we adjourn? Seeing none, thank you so much. This meeting's hereby adjourned. <laughs>